I'm going to talk about meningeal enhancement. Uh, first, uh, just to, to review the anatomy, uh, meninges uh, are composed of three layers. Uh, the dura, uh, also uh, known as the pachy meninges, is a double layer, splits to form the dural sinuses. Uh, uh, otherwise, the two layers are uh, firmly attached to each other and function uh, as one layer. The dura is uh, Firmly attached to the uh, to the uh, calvarium, uh, the leptomeninges, uh, the arachnoid, and the pia. Uh, the arachnoid is just beneath the uh, dura, uh, has this lacy lacy like uh, appearance. Uh, the pia is firmly adherent to the uh, gyri and goes into all of the fissures. So when we talk about meningeal enhancement, uh, we divide it into pachymeningeal and leptomeningeal. Now the uh, arachnoid is normally closely applied to the dura, so uh, sometimes people will call pachymeningeal enhancement dura arachnoid enhancement uh, because it's difficult to tell whether the enhancement is all in the dura or some of it is in the underlying arachnoid. Leptomeningeal enhancement is enhancement of the pia and subarachnoid space. So first, uh, in terms of pachymeningeal enhancement, uh, the dural vessels have no blood-brain barrier. The only reason the dura doesn't normally enhance on MR is because it has a very low water content. The enhancement uh, that we see in the dura is due to uh, vascular congestion and interstitial edema. Pachymeningeal enhancement has a number of causes. Perhaps most importantly, intracranial hypotension. VP shunting uh, may be the same uh, mechanism as intracranial hypotension. Uh, then more focal processes such as uh, meningioma, dural metastases, or dural lymphoma. Inflammatory processes, uh, sarcoid, and more recently described IgG4 related diseases. We also see pachymeningeal enhancement after subdural hematoma, uh, after craniotomy, and in dural sinus thrombosis. Leptomeningeal enhancement is a bit different. The leptomeningeal vessels or the peel vessels do have a blood brain barrier, so we will only see leptomeningeal enhancement when there's breakdown of the blood-brain barrier that allows the contrast to leak into the interstitium of the brain and into the subarachnoid space. Leptomeningeal enhancement, we can see it in infection, infectious meningitis, whether it's pyogenic, tuberculous, fungal, rarely with viral meningitis, but uh, occasionally. Leptomeningeal tumor can either be hematogenous metastases directly to the subarachnoid space or it can be spread to the subarachnoid space from a tumor of the brain or spinal cord. And uh, lymphoma uh, can also cause leptomeningeal enhancement. And uh, in terms of inflammatory diseases, sarcoid, uh, sarcoid can cause both pachymeningeal or leptomeningeal enhancement. Now I just want to show this uh, slide uh, uh, to uh, contrast, this is not uh, leptomeningeal enhancement. Uh, this enhancement here is gyral or cortical enhancement. This is a patient with a subacute infarct, uh, and uh, it can look very similar to leptomeningeal enhancement. Usually the, the gyral enhancement is somewhat thicker than the leptomeningeal enhancement. The leptomeningeal enhancement usually is a, a very thin. Okay, first uh, case, a 65-year-old woman, fever and altered mental status. On the CT, uh, first thing we see is that the supercellular cistern does not have uh, normal density. It seems higher density than CSF. On the bone windows, uh, the sphenoid sinus is opacified, and uh, if we look carefully, the bone is eroded along the margin between the sphenoid sinus and the brain, 
potentially allowing infection to spread from the sphenoid sinus to the intracranial compartment. On MRI, uh, we see leptomeningeal enhancement. So this is leptomeningeal enhancement here along the midbrain. Also leptomeningeal enhancement here in the along the sylvian fissure. We can see some enhancement in the supracellar cistern here. And there's probably also some enhancement in the adjacent uh, brain parenchyma. Uh, also note the patient has hydrocephalus. The hydrocephalus is uh, a fairly common complication of leptomeningeal disease. The leptomeningeal process can interfere with the flow of CSF over the convexities and the CSF resorption leading to hydrocephalus. So this is a patient with pyogenic uh, meningitis. And uh, these are diffusion weighted uh, images. And uh, on the diffusion weighted images, uh, the pus uh, has restricted diffusion, similarly, similar to the way pus within a pyogenic brain abscess has restricted diffusion. So we can see restricted diffusion settling in the dependent portions of the ventricles and also in the, uh, in the fissures uh, due to the uh, pus uh, mixed in with the CSF. Uh, we don't always see this with pyogenic meningitis, but if you see it, that's a, a pretty strong sign you're dealing with a pyogenic infection. This is a 65-year-old man with fever and altered mental status. Again, we see leptomeningeal enhancement, extensive here along the midbrain and in the supracellar cistern. This patient also has mild hydrocephalus. This is a patient with tuberculous meningitis. Fifty-year-old woman with altered mental status also has extensive left meningeal enhancement. See it along the brain stem here, some uh, within the cerebellar folia, along the midbrain and basal cisterns. On the coronal images, we see left meningeal enhancement along the optic chiasm and pituitary stalk. And uh, this is a patient with sarcoid. This patient, a headache, altered mental status, and a history of lung cancer. This one is a little bit more subtle. We do see some faint leptomeningeal enhancement to, within the cerebellar folia, maybe within a few cisterns. And uh, this, uh, of course, is a patient with leptomeningeal metastases from lung cancer. The uh, sagittal images uh, show the uh, leptomeningeal enhancement along the cerebellar folia very nicely. The cerebellar folia is quite a common location for leptomeningeal tumor deposits, probably due to the way the CSF uh, flows. Uh, but uh, this uh, enhancement along the cerebellar folia is a very common finding. These are pre and post contrast flare images. Uh, I just wanted to point out the post-contrast flare images are probably the most sensitive for leptomeningeal enhancement. We can nicely see the enhancement within the sulci. They turn white on these post-contrast flare, again, along the brain stem. Uh, so overall, probably the post-contrast flare is going to be the most sensitive for leptomeningeal enhancement. Forty-year-old woman with postural headache. Now this is different. Uh, this uh, patient uh, does not have left meningeal enhancement. This is pachymeningeal enhancement, and it's a very uniform pachymeningeal enhancement all around the uh, skull and along the uh, falx and tentorium. This very uniform, diffuse pachymeningeal enhancement is very typical for intracranial hypotension. So let's just talk a little bit about intracranial hypotension caused by low CSF pressure. So this can be secondary to surgery or a complication of lumbar puncture, or it can be spontaneous. 
the patients with spontaneous uh, leaks, uh, they're usually most commonly in the thoracic spine, uh, uh, less often in the cervical and lumbar. Uh, they can sometimes be due to a rupture of a root sleeve diverticulum. Occasionally, they're due to a herniated uh, disc uh, that tears through the dura. Uh, many of the time, we never uh, figure out what the cause is. So these patients present with postural headache, frequently have nausea, vomiting, visual disturbances, and hearing disturbances uh, and vertigo. If you do a lumbar puncture, the opening pressure is usually low, uh, usually less than six, but not always. Otherwise, just mild pleocytosis, mildly elevated protein. On MR, what do we see? Diffuse dural enhancement is the most common finding on MR. Occasionally, we'll see subdural hygromas or hematomas. The cerebellar tonsils may be low. This can mimic a Chiari 1 deformity. The veins are engorged. Often, we'll see a rounded appearance of the transverse sinus, and the pituitary is engorged. Uh, so all of these uh, findings uh, are due to the the uh, fact that since the pressure is low, the volume has to be filled with something, so all of the uh, vessels engorge, uh, the dural vessels engorge, and that's what causes the dural enhancement. This is just to, to fill the, the space uh, due to the low pressure. So this is a patient, uh, the uh, image on the left is the baseline, and the image on the right is after the patient developed a postural headache, and you can see uh, that the cerebellar tonsils have descended or, and are now below the frame and magnum. Uh, the pituitary gland has become uh, engorged here compared to the baseline. Also, the straight sinus here is much thicker than on the baseline. So another patient, uh, we see the descent of the cerebellar tonsils engorgement of the pituitary gland. Uh, this uh, demonstrates uh, the rounded appearance of the transverse sinus. The inferior margin of the transverse sinus usually has a concave appearance, but in these patients we often see a convex appearance. So uh, we try to find the source of the leak. Uh, this has been done with radionuclide cisternography, although it's not used very uh, often. Uh, MRI is helpful if there's a very fast leak. We can see extradural accumulation of CSF. And uh, the mainstay is uh, CT myelography. Uh, we'll sometimes also do MR myelography, looking for the source of the leak. Probably about half the time, we're not able to find the source of CSF leak. So this uh, is an example on MR. Patients with a fast CSF leak uh, can have extradural accumulations of fluid. So this uh, line here is the uh, dura. And this is an extradural accumulation of CSF. Here it is on the transverse images. This is the dura here. And we see this collection of CSF outside of the dura, indicating this patient has a, uh, quite a, a fast CSF leak. This is a, a myelogram. This was done uh, with the uh, digital subtraction. This is an uh, early image uh, here, and we start to see some accumulation of contrast uh, uh, in the region of one of the root sleeves. Uh, this is uh, a later uh, image here, which shows more accumulation. This is just a, a magnified view of it, and you see myelographic contrast accumulating outside of the thecal sac, indicating the site of leak, which in this case was along the root sleeve. Uh, this is just a normal root sleeve down here. This is the uh, CT myelogram. So this is the, the dura here, and this is the contrast accumulating outside of the dura at the site of the CSF leak. And this is it here on the coronal images.
So what do we do to treat these patients? Conservative measures are usually tried first, bed rest, hydration, caffeine. Blood patch is most effective if it's injected near the leak and occasionally surgical repair if it's a very large or very fast contrast uh, leak. So this is a patient uh, that we uh, treated uh, with the blood patches. Uh, this patient uh, we treated with both interlaminar and transferaminal uh, blood patch. You can see the images with the needle in place after we did a myelogram. And uh, after uh, about four or five of these, uh, the uh, leak finally uh, resolved. So on the top frame, we have the patient when he was symptomatic. Note the low cerebellar tonsils, this diffuse uniform dural enhancement. And uh, then following treatment, uh, the tonsils are now in a normal position and the dural enhancement uh, has resolved. This was a cervical spine, so because of this uh, pseudo Chiari deformity that interfered with CSF flow, which resulted in this spinal cord edema and syrinx. The difference between edema and syrinx is that uh, syrinx is CSF signal on all sequences. The edema is uh, not, so you can see the, the difference. This part is syrinx here. The rest of it is uh, edema. And following treatment, uh, it uh, virtually resolved. Uh, this is the same thing on transverse uh, images. Uh, you can see the edema here and syrinx in the center. And uh, almost completely resolved to following treatment. Okay, some other uh, patients with pachymeningeal enhancement. This patient has a history of prostate cancer. And uh, again, we see this uh, diffuse pachymeningeal enhancement uh, here. The difference is in this case, uh, there are some areas where it's more focal and thicker here. So this is a patient with metastatic prostate cancer. And uh, if you see the pachymeningeal enhancement somewhat non-uniform where it has some thicker areas uh, than we're more often doing with dealing with some type of neoplastic pachymeningeal uh, involvement. Uh, this patient has extensive pachymeningeal enhancement along the tentorium. This was a patient with sarcoid. Uh, you can see it's actually very dark on T2-weighted images, which is uh, fairly typical for sarcoid. Again, remember, sarcoid causes both pachymeningeal and leptomeningeal disease. Another patient uh, who has diffuse pachymeningeal enhancement probably also has some leptomeningeal enhancement. If we look carefully, this uh, on this uh, exam, there's a filling defect in the sagittal sinus and transverse sinus. This is a patient with dural sinus thrombosis. This patient has a subdural hematoma. You can see on the T2, there's darker material that's layering in the deep, along the dependent uh, areas uh, due to this subdural hematoma. And we can see this pachymeningeal enhancement or dural enhancement along the area of the subdural hematoma. Okay, let's just uh, quickly review. So pachymeningeal enhancement, intracranial hypotension, and VP shunting, and then Neoplasms such as meningioma, dural metastasis lymphoma, inflammatory diseases, sarcoid and IgG4, subdural hematoma, postcraniotomy, and dural sinus thrombosis. And leptomeningeal enhancement, infectious meningitis, pyogenic tuberculous fungal, and occasionally viral, and leptomeningeal tumor, hematogenous metastases to the subarachnoid space or spread from adjacent brain or spinal cord tumor and lymphoma. And finally, sarcoid. Thanks for your attention.